Hello and welcome to Encompass Live on this Wednesday morning. Um, this is Sally Snyder and I had a little bit of a, a tricky setup again today, but things are looking good and we're ready to go. So I'm very excited to introduce our presenter this morning, Rebecca Stavick, who is the Executive Director of the Do Space in Omaha. And she's going to be telling us about that space and all the kinds of things that you may be able to uh, to enjoy while you're there. So go ahead, Rebecca. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm assuming you guys can see my screen. Yes, no, maybe? I yeah, can I just, see. You can see it? I can see it, yes. All right, awesome. Well, thank you so much, everyone, um, for coming and listening to a little bit more about do space. Um, thank you so much, uh, you know, especially to Krista, Krista Burns for asking me to uh, speak a little bit today. Before I get started and telling you a little bit more about do space, I'll just tell you a little bit more about myself. Um, I'm originally from South Dakota, but I uh, grew up in Georgia and I've been in Nebraska now for about six years. Um, I did my master's degree in information, uh, library and information science from San Jose State. I think I finished that in 2012. I can't believe it's been that long. Um, when I first moved to Omaha about six years ago, I started working at Omaha Public Library as a library aide, and I was um, shelving books, and then I became a clerk and then a specialist and did some reference work. Uh, my final position there was in administration, working on you know, staff development initiatives. And also, uh, during that time in my life, I was working on a lot of open data initiatives in the community, which I affectionately can be called as uh, civic hacking. So uh, this, this is uh, about volunteers coming together and using local data to um, take that data and create apps so that uh, community members have more access to their local information. So um, as part of my job then at OPL, um, being really active in the tech community here in Omaha, I thought about a lot of different ways that OPL um, could kind of engage with the tech and startup communities. So. Um, I've been, I was named Executive Director of Do Space in February 2015, and we've, <coughs> excuse me, we've been kind of chugging along ever since then. When I first started, I was the only employee. I um, was then tasked with building the organization, and then uh, once I had everyone hired, you know, running it. So. It's just been an incredible, uh, incredible moment for Omaha to have a project like this, and um, so I'm, I'm excited to tell you guys a little bit more about it. Um, by the way, feel free to um, you know throw out questions there in the chat. Um, I have found that a lot of times when I present on Do Space, I tend to have just an incredible number of questions, and I love that. So um, definitely write your questions down. I'm going to leave some space here at the end, um, you know, some good time for us to chat a little bit. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts, um, your questions, ideas, everything um, towards the end of the presentation. So. Um, so that's me. Let's talk about do space a little bit. <coughs> I will apologize right now. I've got a little bit of a cough, um, but hopefully that won't bother you too much. So do space. Um, you know, before I tell you a little bit about what do space is specifically, um, let me tell you a little bit about why it exists. Um, as librarians, you guys know, you know, there is still a distinct digital divide in our country, right, across the country, um, and especially in our towns and cities, you can see still a distinct digital divide. That um, is still absolutely the case here in Omaha. 
uh, based on the American Community Survey results that have been coming out now for about two years, we now have some insight into what the digital divide actually looks like here in Omaha. And you can take that data, put it across the city, and if you look at it into quadrants, and even look at it um, uh, here in Omaha, 72nd and Dodge is the very center of town. That's where due space is located. 72nd Street that runs north and south, if you're looking at the American Community Survey data, you'll see that only about 77% of people living on the eastern side of the city have access to the internet. <coughs> Excuse me. And on the western side of the city, so west of 72nd Street, it's more like 90 to 95% of folks have um, internet service at home. So um, here in Omaha, then, we do have a distinct digital divide here that um, we've still got quite a few people in the community who do not have internet access at home, and they do not have um, computers at home. Now, the digital divide and what that looks like has changed uh, dramatically in the past decade, right? I mean, it's more and more people have access through uh, mobile devices, um, but perhaps do not have stationary machines. I think this is just the, t the changing nature of technology. Things in, are much more mobile than they were even just a few years ago. But what's interesting about that, though, is that um, if you think a little bit about your experience on an iPhone or your Android phone compared to your computing experience on a work, like a workstation computer, you know, phones are specifically designed to be uh, simple, uh, easy to use, uh, user-friendly. And um, you really cannot have, a, you, you can't get that exposure to a more advanced kind of computing environment just through a phone, at least at this point in time. So for those people who only rely on their phones to access the internet, and maybe that's their number one piece of technology in their lives, um, they are not getting that opportunity to, to access more advanced software, um, different kinds of computing devices, et cetera. So, uh, <coughs> so that, that is a problem. It's not just a problem in Omaha. It's a problem in society. There's another problem, though, that I would argue that is bigger um, and uh, more challenging and more pressing than the digital divide, and that would be um, uh, creating more opportunities for our citizens to engage in digital learning, um, boosting technology literacy. You know, more and more we have access to, te to, to technology and to the Internet, but what are we doing with it? Are we really um, exploring what it, what is uh, coming down the road? And you know, I think a little bit about things like uh, Internet of Things, for instance, uh, smart devices that are connected to the internet. Um, you know, we as citizens really need to have at least a very basic understanding of technology, um, computers, software, uh, using the internet, those sorts of things. That all has to be kind of taken care of. That's got to be a given before you can really even understand what's coming next, this whole wave of smart devices. Um, and, and not only understand the basics of uh, you know, the cloud and IoT and all of that, but to really fully understand the, uh, the pros and cons and the impacts of these kinds of rapid technological developments on society, on culture, on privacy, on the economy. So, um, so in that vein, then, do space really is exists to help increase access to technology and offer the Omaha community opportunities to learn new kinds of tech, hardware, software, whatever. Um, in a free and inclusive community space. Um, so if you really boil down do space to two things, that's what it's going to be. It's going to be access to technology and access to free tech learning. <coughs> Excuse me. 
So I'm going to show you some pictures here of the building, and then I'm going to get into um, some more specifics then on the technology and programs that we offer here at DoSpace. Let me just show you these pictures here real quick. Several of these pictures are available on our website or on um, our Flickr page. Um, so let me, let me just chat really quick about the building. Um, if you guys are in Omaha, from Omaha, if you've been here, um, you'll know that this building was once a Borders. Um, I did not live in Omaha when this was a Borders store, but I swear it had to have been like the largest bookstore in the world. Because this is a 28,000 square foot um, building, and uh, it's just, it's a big building for what must have been a very, very large bookstore. So um, so this was once a Borders store, and um, Borders, of, of course, went out of business, and this building laid vacant for almost five years. And um, we got into the building, uh, gutted it on the inside, and obviously did quite a lot on the outside by adding um, some digital LED signage and um, this, this front part that kind of glows. <coughs> um, if you're familiar with this area of town, uh, this is 72nd and Dodge. I mentioned this is the very center of Omaha. Um, when we were planning this project in the very early uh, stages, you know, our goal, if, if our goal is to provide access to technology and learning experiences for everyone, we really had to pick a, a strategic space to launch this project. And 72nd and Dodge is easy to get to from all spaces in the city. And I'd also say it's a bit of a transit hub. It is very easy, or it's easier to get to this intersection via the bus system than probably any other space in town. Um, and that was very important to us to make sure that if we had to only pick one space, we had to make sure that we were in a really great space for everyone throughout the city to come to. So um, it's also really great. This, this is the Crossroads neighborhood, and I, I think it's really kind of refreshing to see uh, you know, new development and fresh, fresh things going on in this part of town. <coughs> Excuse me. This is just a quick shot um, of the front of the building when you walk in. To the left there, you'll see part of our 3D lab, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Um, I'm going to get you on our website and talk a little bit more about our specific pieces of technology. Um, here you can see this is our computer lab area. Um, you'll, you'll see here, if, if you can um, see those computers, You'll notice that we actually, uh, we've got a lot of different kinds of computers. And typically when you think of a computer lab, you're going to think uh, 30 computers, they're all PCs, they all have the exact same software, and they all basically do the same thing. Um, that's not what our approach is here. Our approach here is let's offer a little bit of everything and see what the community responds to. So in our computer lab area, we have um, both Macs and PCs. We have um, high seating, low seating. We have accessibility stations for people who uh, have low vision. Um, we've got dual monitor stations that have AutoCAD and, uh, you know, some more robust design tools. Um, so our goal here was really to just kind of mix it up. Um, as far as I understand, Do Space is the only space in town in, in Omaha where you can get access to a Mac computer for free. Um, <coughs> excuse me. This is our, um, we call this our teen room. Um, all these photos that I'm showing you, of course, are professional photography. So this is actually before we open. But this was uh, a room that we called our like teen hangout space. But we're changing the name of it to Active Learning Lab because on the other side of uh, this room, we've got a large video wall where kids can do video games. 
And we've seen such a, a wide range of ages in this space. We just didn't think it made a lot of sense to um, make it specific to one age group. This is a quick shot of part of our Littles Lab area where um, little kids come in. And this space, um, if you're, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with story times. If you think about a story time, um, just engaging a little bit more with technology, um, that's what we call our Littles Lab program. Kids come in on Tuesdays and Saturdays and have some kind of a learning activity with tech. Um, and they're always a lot of fun. Uh, this here is the second floor of the building. <coughs> this is uh, Metropolitan Community College. It's on our second floor. And so they offer um, continuing education, like non-credit classes. So um, you can actually then come into do space you know, our goal is to bring people into the first floor, get them excited about technology, expose them to new things, hopefully inspire them to, to use technology for, you know, to, uh, you know, pursue their dreams, get things done, um, you know, be of use. And then if you're looking to really take things to the next level, um, you're looking to, uh, you know, really take a series possibly on Microsoft Office programs or um, you want to do something uh, on that more advanced level, then you can quite literally go to the next level on the second floor of the building and take a, a non-credit class with Metro. And this is such a, an amazing opportunity for partnership because Metro offers um, more advanced tech-related stuff but you don't have to be a student and you don't have to pay, uh, you know, hefty tuition and all of that to get access to that. And that was a really important piece of our partnership with Metro Community College upstairs. Um, they've got a, a really big, you can see here, <coughs> excuse me, a really nice big uh, space. So, <coughs> excuse me. These are just a few other pictures um, I added in here. Um, this is a little slab program. These devices are called BeeBots. They also have a version of this called, I think it's called BlueBot, that runs off of Bluetooth. But this is a really great example of one of the activities we use in, in Little's Lab because um, BeeBots are a little toy for kids that teaches them the logic behind learning how to code. Because code is really just um, a string of commands that you're issuing to a computer. And these little bots then teach children um, kind of the fundamentals of how to create those, uh, those lines of code. <coughs> Excuse me. And here's just some pictures of some folks using the building. Um, we've always got creative, creative folks here um, hanging out, um, playing with robots. This is another awesome device. It's, um, this is part of a kit called the Dash and Dot Robot. Um, kids love this. It connects to various apps and it teaches you how to learn, learn how to code um, over time. This was just a, uh, one of my favorite pictures from a program. Uh, this is a light painting workshop that we did. So this is, uh, you know, the slow exposure of photography. And so kids would kind of paint in the air using light. It's a lot of fun. And here's, a, here's just some pictures of folks using the space. To the left here, we've got a nice lady using what's called an egg bot. This is a little robot that uh, uses Sharpie markers to write on spherical objects. So last year we had a lot of fun doing um, really cool Christmas ornament stuff. And to the right here we've got two kids interacting with a telepresence robot. This is called a double robot. Um, if you want to do a meeting with someone across the world, you can send them a link and that link will grant them access to this robot and they can completely control it. They can roll it around the whole building. 
They can be in meetings. Um, their face will be right there on the iPad. It's a lot of fun. So, And this is that active learning lab that I had mentioned earlier. This is just a, a particularly busy day. <coughs> Excuse me. What you're seeing here is um, a bunch of kids working with tech kits. And I will talk a little bit more about that um, here in just a second. I'm going to pull up the website and tell you a little bit more specifics about the tech we've got here. Um, but this is another group playing with one of our tech kits as well. And um, this is uh, some of my very favorite things that have been created here at DoSpace. We 3D printed a fully functioning violin. Um, obviously, we didn't 3D print the strings or the wood piece there. I'm not a musician, so I don't know a whole lot about this, but we have had some musicians come in and actually play this. Last year, we had a concert, um, a little holiday concert, and we had some really cool songs played on, on the machine, on the uh, violin. To the right here, you'll see um, we had one person 3D print a full-size human brain and uh, then also laser cut a uh, chessboard. So let me take you guys to our website so I can tell you a little bit more specifically what you can find at DoSpace. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, our website here is just DoSpace.org. Um, you know, in terms of technology, we have, um, as I mentioned, we've got our public computer lab um, with a lot of different kinds of hardware and software. The computers that are out there, um, we have a, a computer reservation system, not unlike probably what you guys have in your library of systems. Um, there's quite a few pieces of software that we use here to run operations that are uh, they are, it's library software. There's uh, not a, quite a lot, that's not a huge, huge market of having to um, kind of manage a, a public computer lab. So <clears throat> we have um, quite a few different pieces of software. I'll go ahead and just show you this list here. Um, instead of going through all of it, because <laughs> um, you'll see there's quite a lot of different stuff here available for people. But what I'll say is that when we designed this space, it was just vitally important to us that we offered advanced software for people to use. You know, Adobe, Photoshop, Illustrator, InDesign, these first three here um, are some of the uh, most commonly used pieces of software here. This is very expensive stuff. I mean, Adobe Creative Suite is expensive software. We have AutoCAD that is uh, very expensive. And the reason why that we, we really made this investment is because there are just so many people who cannot afford this. And if we can really step up and invest in this kind of software, you know, what's, what is the potential? Like, what kinds of opportunities could people uh, potentially have just through accessing it? I've had a lot of small business owners in using Photoshop and InDesign um, and being very thankful that they didn't have to um, you know, purchase these items on their own. So I, I believe this is one of the things that makes DoSpace um, particularly unique, um, that we offer, we offer hardware and software for a very basic user, right? somebody who just wants to come in and use a computer. But we also offer hardware and software for people who might be learning their fifth coding language, or they've been 3D printing for years and they want to use one of our really advanced machines. I think that this, um, this is very important, that we begin to offer more and more advanced technologies to our communities because only then will they have that opportunity to take their skills to the next level. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, another thing that I wanted to just tell you a little bit more about from one of those pictures, we have some tech 
tech activity kits. And this is one of our most popular things here at DoSpace. We have identified a variety of um, technology learning toys, um, experimental pieces of technology. Um, I'm sure several of these you guys have heard of. Um, you might just have it at your libraries as well. Um, what we have done is we've taken some of these items and we've created activity kits. So people will come in and they can check out the kit to use in the building and then um, just hack away on it. Um, several of these are robotics. Um, some are very simple. Google Cardboard is not necessarily a technological device, but it is when you connect it to certain apps on your smartphone. <coughs> Goldie blocks, for instance, this is um, this is a construction kit for girls to really um, inspire them to get into engineering. Um, so we have a lot of different tech kits, and this changes all the time. We're always scheming on different um, activity kits to have here. One of the real feature key pieces of Do Space is our 3D lab which I can see we do not have any good pictures of on this page. But our 3D lab has um, a laser cutter, vinyl cutter, um, three 3D printers, and we're always looking to add more, more stuff to our 3D lab. <clears throat> it was kind of important to me that we didn't call it a makerspace. I personally am completely sick of that word. <laughs> And we also don't have, you know, uh, big saws and uh, sawdust flying through the air. You know, our lab is um, a clean lab space, and it's a space for 3D technologies. So um, not only do we have 3D printers, um, we've got a wide variety of uh, 3D modeling software. Um, that people can use. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, let me see if I can get you guys. There we go. That's a better picture. So this is part of our 3D lab here, and you'll see we've got um, some pretty large printers. Um, one of the things that makes our printers unique is that um, our large printer there, Dimension 1200 ES, and then the smaller version there, um, U, the Uprint SE Plus. Um, these printers actually they print in a support material, so that you can create increasingly advanced designs and larger 3D prints. This is important too. Again, you know I've mentioned this. Okay, 3D printing is not new. This is not new technology. This has been around for a while. Well, how can we empower the people who are interested in this, who are using 3D printing to do prototyping and to uh, learn new things? How can we empower them to take it to the next level? That that is kind of you'll see that's kind of an overarching theme into do space of this isn't just about access to tech. We've got to take it a step further now so that we can really empower beginners to become intermediate, intermediate folks to become advanced. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So, yeah, so uh, we also have some meeting rooms here in the space that uh, this is one of our conference rooms. We have two conference rooms and a large meeting room. Um, you know, we use them a lot for our programs. Um, but you can also use these uh, if you're a nonprofit. You can use them for free. If you're for profit, we charge a fee to use the rooms. Um, yeah, great. Let me tell you a little bit more about programs. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, we run anywhere between 60 and 80 programs every month. Um, if you see here on our website at events and scroll down, you'll, you can take a look at the types of things that we offer here. Uh, we're not a public library. We're a 501c3. We're a nonprofit. 
but similar to a public library, we really aim to serve everybody in society, right? No pressure, right? <laughs> so the idea is how can we craft um, program offerings that are all te technologically related that um, serve both a very young audience um, all the way to senior citizens, everyone in between, and um, people of all levels of expertise. So we're talking all ages, all levels of expertise. So we've got some stuff here that are, that are fairly basic, <clears throat> and we've also got some more advanced things. Uh, our programs for children, um, for kid, little kids, as well as like middle school age kids, have been very, very successful, and um, we do our Junior Makers Club. You'll see that on Tuesdays, Junior Makers um, has been really successful, and we do a lot with uh, learning how to code. Learning how to code, um, you hear a lot about this in the media, of how everybody needs to learn how to code. Now, um, I don't totally agree with that. I think that People need to understand the logic behind coding, and they think that they need to understand the larger impacts of how code has driven and defined our digital experience. Um, but if we really want to be futuristic, um, you know, at some point machine learning is going to take over and um, code itself over time. We'll see, right? Even to, to get into machine learning, um, if you guys have read anything about some of the developments there, people still need to learn how to code to be able to engage in that. But um, I think we're embarking on a very exciting time for, uh, for computing technology, for sure. Um, but anyway, it is still very important, especially for girls, to learn how to code. Um, we've launched uh, the largest Girls Who Code Club in Omaha. It just started in September, and this is a pretty intense program. Um, kids would apply to be part of it. We've got 21 girls who are a part of this club, and they meet every single week for an entire school year. So this is not um, something to be taken lightly. You know, these girls um, really put in a lot of effort every week. <coughs> Excuse me. And they're working on some some really big some really big stuff. So um, I'm very proud of our Girls Who Code program. I'll also tell you a little bit about something um, called Hello Code. Hello Code is a program that we've designed here uh, that we launched over the summer. Um, Hello Code. If you think a little bit about how an adult would learn how to code right now. Let's say I'm an adult, I want to maybe pick up a new skill or I want to get into a new job. How do I do that? Well, I can get online and I can learn on my own by myself as much as I can. Or I can drop everything, quit my job, and go to a code school full time and spend $10,000 doing that. You could potentially also go back to school to try to learn how to code um, as well. So there doesn't seem to really be anything in the middle. There's no, um, uh, I want to learn how to code on my own, but as part of a community. And so when we designed Hello Code, our goal was really to, to set people up for success in um, getting a taste of what it would let, be like to actually become a software engineer or um, a web developer. So Hello Code then is an application only program. We take applications for this. It is free, but um, we want to make sure that the people who come in are very serious about learning computer programming. Participants will come in for a week and they will go through existing HTML and CSS modules that are um, online, and then they meet with a professional web developer every week. So it's a little bit of a flipped classroom model. So the expectation is on our Hello Code students that they're learning on their own, 
but they're not really alone because they're part of a class of Hello Code students, and then they also have the web developer that they meet with every week to help them along. The goal really by the end of the month is that they can um, you know, hand code their own website. And it's really great. We've actually had some people go through this program and then apply to go to real code school. It's like a six to, uh, I think it's an eight week program. There's two code schools here in Omaha. So um, a lot of people who have applied to this are looking for new jobs. Um, they're mothers and re-entering the workforce. <coughs> Excuse me. So we, we're going to definitely continue uh, this program. It's been really great. Um, let's see here. We've got anything else to chat about here with programs. You know, our programs have been very experimental. Uh, there's definitely been some programs we've run and uh, nobody cares and we're like, well, oh well, <laughs> crossing that one off, we won't do that again. Um, you know, this do space as a whole really is an experimental space, so we have quite a lot of freedom when it comes to designing these programs. You know, overall, if you were to look back on the full year of programs that we've run, you'll see trends for sure. We have a program framework that we work within, but it's flexible enough to allow some experimentation and to allow some failure because without that, how are you going to learn? So, <coughs> um, one other uh, quick program I just want to let you know about is Cyber Seniors. Um, this is a club that is for seniors by seniors. It is completely run by senior citizen volunteers. And um, every, every Wednesday morning, they're, they're here right now. And um, our joke on this is really just it's so successful that we could take this off the calendar and, and they would just keep coming. And what's, what's really so perfect about Cyber Seniors is that this is a community-owned program. We started it. We have staff to support it, but the community owns it, and they, they lead it. And to me, that is really a sign of a successful program, is that the community has, has just grabbed it, and they've just they're just running with it. I love it. It's great. Okay, um, just in a, a, let's see what my time is looking like. <coughs> I want to tell you just a little bit about our performance in the past year. Um, you know, uh, since we opened last November, there's been over 170,000 visits to our building. And in terms of membership in the past year, we're, um, we're almost at about 40,000 members. Membership at Do Space is totally free. It's very similar to a library card. Um, the key difference, though, is that um, since we are not fund, we are entirely privately funded, um, so we are not funded by taxpayers, um, and therefore we do not have any residency requirements. So I don't care where you live. Um, you can live on the other side of the country and, and grab yourself a free Do Space membership to utilize that. Um, this has been really great for um, folks in Sarpy County, uh, Council Bluffs, um, for some of the big events here in Omaha, uh, you know, College World Series, swim trials, um, all these big events where we have a lot of people coming to visit Omaha, they can come in and grab a membership and just use the space, um, and it's no big deal. So um, that's a lot of fun. Um, so those are just some of our big, like, annual totals. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so we're, you know, almost at 40,000 members. Um, we have had, in terms of hours of computer use, that's almost at about 60,000. But one of the ways that I kind of like to visualize the use of do space is an average day at do space, which you'll see here on your screen. This is um, an average, then, of a lot of the stats that we look at over time. Um, you know, uh, new memberships per day, uh, daily visits, computer sessions, um, average number of tech, tech kit checkouts. 
And uh, <clears throat> I get asked quite a lot, you know, uh, how do you know if this is successful? And I'd say, well, we don't, right? I mean, we don't have anything in the country to compare this to. There is no benchmark out there that we're attempting to reach. Um, we kind of quite literally are setting that benchmark. So um, what I'd say is, have we been successful? Absolutely. I, I look at these numbers and I say, you know what, I think Omaha is probably using due space pretty well. Um, but you can't, you can't derive success just from numbers, right? Um, you really have to take a look at how people are using the space. Like, what are you actually doing at Do Space? How have, um, what have you been able to achieve? Um, so I real quick wanted to just show you this website that we launched. It's called iheartdospace.org. <coughs> This is how we can kind of measure impact on our members um, and, and see a little bit more into uh, what people are accomplishing here. So um, people can come to this website, I'm at DoSpace, and then you pick a verb and then type in what you're doing. And then if you hit next, it goes to a form that will give you a little bit more information can select a photo um, and submit it to the website. Um, and we can click on one here. So this person's just working on some schoolwork. Um, this person uh, is working through a code school, working on, his eight, on HTML and CSS. Ooh, homemade pickle label design. Holly's pickles. Somebody's designing a pickle label. That's awesome. You know, so we we really uh, created this website. Whoops. We created this website. Oh, sadness. Anyway, <coughs> we created this so that people could really just um, talk a little bit about themselves um, and what they have been able to accomplish here. So, if there's any other question of like, what are people doing at Do Space? You can always just pull up iheartdospace.org and you can take a look at the community submissions. Um, so that's a lot of fun. We do um, we do some contests with this over the summer and, and things like that. So yeah, well, um, so I think this gives you at least um, some fair overview of Do Space. Um, I think it's probably a good time though for us to answer any questions you guys might have um, about the project that may have missed. Um, do we have any questions so far? Um, uh, we have one question that asks, how is this funded? Yeah, great question. So um, in the very early days of the project, so we're going back several years, this was really the brainchild of um, several community leaders coming together to answer that question of how we can get more technology into the community. And um, to be more specific, uh, uh, Heritage Services is a nonprofit in town, and they do fundraising for like huge community projects. Um, so we were fortunate enough to work with them to get up and running on the project. Um, we worked with them on construction, architecture, and um, fundraising there at the beginning of the project. <coughs> Excuse me. So we are 100% privately funded. That's incredible. Um, another person asks, is there a charge for printing? Yeah, uh-huh. So um, for printing, if you're printing like a piece of paper, it's 10 cents a page. I think that's kind of almost standard in a lot of libraries. It's 10 cents a page, black and white, 25 cents for color. Um, if you are 3D printing something and you want to take that object home with you, uh, we do have to charge a fee on the material because we have to buy more material. Um, and so that cost uh, 
it's a little bit harder to just throw out a number because it really depends on um, the amount of filament that you use, the amount of support material you use, the density and the size of what you're trying to print. Um, but, <coughs> excuse me, when people 3D print, um, you have just like a really quick consultation with our staff to make sure your print will go through just fine. And at that time, we estimate the cost for you so that you know um, about how much it's going to be. So, yeah. Thank you. Now, this is a more personal question because you were talking about memberships and how many new memberships a day there are, and those were interesting numbers. But my question is, okay, I live in Lincoln, and I sometimes get to Omaha. If I just stop in sometime, is everybody allowed a membership? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, so when you, you can actually do a membership right here. <coughs> Excuse me. We do not mail out cards, so if you do this online, um, you will still need to come in and um, get your card, but this will set up your account. Um, so you can do it online or you can come in. Uh, we don't even ask for an ID when you come in to get your membership. Um, this is, uh, I kind of liken it almost to like a fuel saver card, you know, where you go to the grocery store and they're just like, they just give it to you. Um, this is, these are the required things. I mean, it's literally, we just need your name, address, um, contact information, and then we've got some optional um, demographics that help us better understand um, our membership base and then tell you you've got to set a password and that's it. Um, you know, this is, since we're a nonprofit and, um, you know, like I said, we don't serve any particular group of taxpayers in Nebraska, um, we have the freedom to do this. But I'll say too that this has this, this process really knocks down a lot of barriers for people who don't have an ID, um, who don't necessarily live in one particular place for uh, an extended period of time. I'll also say, too, that um, we do not check anything out outside of the building. So the liability part of it, you know, public libraries have a lot of liability, right? You've got books and DVDs and equipment that's going out of the building. <laughs> you might want to check ID on those, right? But for us, um, nothing really leaves our building. Um, we did consider that as an option at the beginning of the project, but um, I just have literally not heard any demand from anyone that um, they want us to check out technology into the community. Um, what the feedback we've been getting from members is that they want just an incredible in-building experience, and so that's our goal to get it to them. So, yeah, great question. Well, a tag on to that is um, I, un I understand that sometimes when people hear the word membership, they're thinking, oh, I have to pay for my year's membership for this, and I understand there is no fee for this. It's just a way for you to keep track of who's around, is that right? Yeah, well, and this sets you up um, to log into the computers, and when you come to our programs, which are all free, when you come to our programs, we um, scan you in with your card. Um, oh. so that's, that's how that works. <laughs> so anyone can come, get a membership, there's no fee, you need your card to attend the classes, and that makes sense. But you could just walk around the building and enjoy what's there. Yeah. Oh, for and sure. So when are you open? Um, right now we are open 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. every day. Wow. Um, but we're changing that in December. Um, we've realized that uh, weekends, on the weekend nights, um, people don't really care about being out and about after about 7 o'clock on Saturdays and Sundays. So in December, we're changing our hours on the weekends to be open 9 a.m. to 7 p.m., Saturday and Sunday. And then in December as well, we're going to launch a little bit of an experiment. Um, in this particular part of town um, in Omaha, 
there's a lot of business people in the on Dodge on in the Dodge area very early in the morning and since we've been opening at 9 a.m. we haven't really been able to serve um, those folks who are in this part of town very early so in December we're going to launch an experiment and open at 7 a.m. Wow. Um, so but 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. will be called early bird hours so not everything will be available um, it's kind of a limited service type model in those first uh, two hours, but that would mean then that, that we're open 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. Monday through Friday. That's great. Yeah. We, we have another question um, asking, who is teaching patrons how to use Photoshop or other software? Mm -hmm. If they just come in or, or do you have just classes for that? Um, yeah, we've got a lot of resources. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So as we know, uh, people tend to learn in a variety of ways, right? Some people are going to just come in here, jump on a computer, and teach themselves Photoshop, right? Some people just do that. Other people will want to come in, and maybe they'll do that, but they'll ask a few questions, in which case we have um, a staff tech help desk. Um, where uh, my staff as well as volunteers are staffed any hour of the day that we're open. Um, so we always have staff and volunteers here and available to an help answer questions. But let's say you want to really kind of delve into it a little bit more. You've got a few other options. So you're learning Photoshop, but um, you really just kind of need the basics and you need a little bit more help. Um, we definitely have Photoshop workshops that you can sign up for for free. So you can learn as part of a class, kind of almost a little bit more classroom environment. But if you are <clears throat> really struggling with something specific in Photoshop and you really just need to sit down with somebody, um, we do take appointments to meet with mentors. So we have a pretty large volunteer base. Um, the exact number of volunteers that we have changes, um, you know, month to month, but it's it's about 200 volunteers. Um, a big a big group of that are our community mentors. These are people who um, work and live in Omaha, and they have some tech specialty, and they have signed up to uh, volunteer to meet with people one on one on specific tech questions. So if you said, look, I know the basics of Photoshop, but there's this one technique or there's this one part of it that I'm really looking to um, spend some more time on, we could set up a free one-on-one -on -one mentor appointment for you. You could come into DoSpace and meet with this volunteer who's a specialist in Photoshop, and they will work through that with you. Um, and, <coughs> excuse me, you can find this on resources mentor request. Um, so if you're looking to brush up on a specific skill, you can just go down here and um, put in your information and tell us what you need help with. And um, then we'll match you up with somebody. That's great. Yeah. I have just a couple more questions, I think. We've had a couple of thank yous already. But also, um, you were talking about times of day, you know, evening and morning. But I'm assuming, as libraries, we know when a busy time of day for a library is after school. But do you have that same thing, a busier time of day than others? Oh, for sure. Um, after school, after work, 5 o'clock, five, 5 to 6, 6.30ish is absolutely our busiest time, Monday through Friday. And then midday on the weekends, um, you know, having uh, been a, a former librarian, or I guess once a librarian, always a librarian, right? Um, having uh, used to used to being work at um, OPL, I think that that's um, pretty standard, right? It's um, something that librarians see kind of across the board: people getting out of school and work. Um, coming into the space, um, and then midday on the weekends is really popular too, so, yeah. Great, thank you. M one more quick thing, oh, 
a uh, person says, thank you, the Omaha area is so lucky, <laughs> which, well, we can all use you if we get to town, so that's nice. The other question I have is you talked about the, the different kits and things and how you're always adding to or changing them around. Are there other possible future services that you're thinking of as well? Or, I mean, because you have a lot of services right now. Yes. Well, you know, um, we're really proud to be able to say that there's just nothing like do space in the country and that we are a high-tech space. Well, um, in order for us to maintain that and to continue to say that, we really have to stay on top of technology. Um, so that means that uh, we'll be experimenting with all kinds of stuff into really even just the next few months. Um, it's my hope that into 2017 we can get some virtual reality, um, maybe augmented reality equipment here to help expose uh, people to that new, uh, really exciting uh, part of, of technology now. Um, but yeah, you know, and especially with 3D printing, one thing that you probably, is probably not on our website yet, but we've recently purchased a resin 3D printer. And um, this is interesting just because, first off, I don't know of any I don't know of any community space in the country that has a resin printer, and I don't know of any place in Omaha at all, even at UNO, that has a resin printer like the one that we have recently purchased. Um, resin 3D printing um, is very, uh, it's very Terminator. So imagine, imagine a pool of liquid resin, and then the 3D printer pulls the print out of that liquid um, and it's it's just incredible. I would say definitely Google resin 3D printing. Um, uh, it's, it's very fascinating to watch. Uh, there's quite a lot on YouTube about this new kind of 3D printing. Um, so yeah, for sure, there's, there's quite a bit of uh, new stuff that uh, will keep our offerings fresh over time. Um, yeah. Well, that's great. I'm looking and I'm not seeing any more questions. So I think anyone can also contact you at the, the Do Space as well if they have other questions. Is that yeah. true? For sure. Um, you know, up here uh, we've got our website. Um, at the bottom here you can get in touch or email us at hello at dospace.org. Um, I will, I, I do want to mention something, <coughs> excuse me, really quick before we finish, and that's just that um, it's really my hope that Do Space uh, brings value to the library profession, to the library world. And um, I want Do Space to be a resource for libraries and for librarians. So, um, kind of just an, an open, uh, question of like what can what can we do to help libraries I know that's a really big question we probably don't have like an immediate answer to that but um, I want to continue to engage in a conversation especially with Nebraska librarians about um, technology community technology and um, you know I'm very interested in, in how do space can help support um, Nebraska libraries, um, however, however that is, um, you know. So just just know that I I am a librarian. I have a library background, and um, I want Do Space to be of of use. So if there's anything, if you have any ideas, any thoughts, any anything like that at all, um, you can feel free. You can email us at that hello at Do Space. If you even make that out to me, they just forward it straight to my inbox. So, um, you know, if you ever want to reach out, ever have any further questions at, at all, I, I would be happy to chat with you. Great. Thank you so much. And remember that the presentation will be saved to our archive of Encompass Lives, and along with that we'll have um, your email and um, the, the Do Space web page things like that, that people can access to find out how to get in touch with you or, or get in touch with the Do Space. So um, 
I jotted down what you said, iHeartNewSpace.org, to be sure we get that on there too. So um, thank you again. Thank you so much. This has been fascinating. And I haven't been to the Do Space yet, but I'm a going. I'm telling you. <laughs> That'll be great. Come, on, come and visit. <laughs> thank you. And this ends our Encompass Live for today, and we hope you'll join us next week for our uh, next. I'm just going to call this up and see if I can get to that. Um, well, I'll just go to the calendar. Next week we have networking. Let's see what that's about. Uh, Chris Brown is an assistant library director at the Pella, Iowa Public Library, and he's worked more than eight years in public libraries as an IT professional, including managing the IT for a seven-branch library system. And he's going to present on your network, your computer network, and things that you may want to know about it. So we hope you can join us next week at 10 o'clock Central Time for Encompass Live and also we always of course record our presentations. Thank you.